Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get into that, I want to thank you for coming to my channel. Thank you for watching my videos and thank you for your support. I really do appreciate it very much. Thank you. The first item that I have today is entitled, She Survived a Death Camp Facing Biden DOJ Charges She Is Prepared to Die in Prison. This, for me, was a disturbing story. Eva Eddy is her name. She was 10 years old in a World War II era death camp. Charged by President Joe Biden's Justice Department with violating the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, Edie faces up to 11 years in prison and $350,000 fines. She is about to turn 89 years old. Drawing on her brutal experiences with communism in what was then Yugoslavia, she refuses to underestimate those who have the power to suppress her. Oppress her, excuse me, recalling how her mother couldn't believe they were in danger until it was too late. We haven't done anything wrong. Who would harm us, she remembered her mother saying. Then our whole people were destroyed, Edie said. We hadn't done anything wrong as far as I know. As Danube Swabians, an ethnic German-speaking group, Edie and her family were rounded up in the aftermath of World War II by soldiers under the direction of Yugoslavia's communist leader, Josip Broz, commonly known as Tito. She described how she was shipped off in cattle cars to a concentration camp in Yugoslavia at age nine. We were packed body to body, and being a small child, I could hardly breathe. We had no food, no water. Uh, the camp, named Gakawa or Gakovo, according to Edie, was primitive, she said, and its purpose was the extermination of the Danube Swabians. Many of those in Gakawa with Edie died from starvation or disease and were buried in mass graves. I, I didn't even know about this. This is, this is after the war. This is after. And now, I was not even aware of this. It blows my mind that I didn't know this. I mean, there's so much that we don't know about what goes on in the world. And, and so much of the evil that goes on in the world. The FACE Act prohibits use of force, obstruction, or property damage intended to interfere with reproductive health care services. Though it theoretically protects houses of worship and pregnancy resource centers, as well as abortion clinics, the Biden administration's Justice Department has largely used FACE to prosecute pro-life activists like Edie. The Justice Department has thrice charged Edie with violating the FACE Act, first for an August 2020 blockade of a Sterling Heights, Michigan abortion clinic, second for an April 2021 blockade in Saginaw, Michigan, and third for a March 2021 incident at a Nashville, Tennessee abortion clinic. The DOJ charged eight defendants in the Sterling Heights incident and 11 defendants in the Nashville incident. This is, I don't even know how to react to this. I really don't. In this country, we are supposed to have, we are supposed to have the right to protest peacefully. These people were protesting peacefully. You can read the article for yourself and see what they did. They're not allowed to show pictures or images in their trials. They're not allowed to say that they acted in order to save lives. This is not America. This is not, this is not how America is supposed to work. How is this possible? I just am... Uh, I don't even know how to react to something like this. It just, 
it breaks my heart. It absolutely breaks my heart. This is not the country that I served for. It's not. And it's not going to change unless we change the administration because it's this administration that's doing this. It's the only way. Uh, the second article I have is entitled Overreaching Prosecution Tactics Face High Court Scrutiny in January 6th Cases. I'm sure you're all familiar with the so-called insurrection of January 6th, which over time and, and the revelations of uh, videos that we've seen and so forth, we found that it wasn't exactly an, an insurrection after all, that they were allowed to enter the, the Capitol by the police. Some of them were escorted by police without any violence whatsoever. <sighs> the Justice Department could easily use a law aimed at destruction of evidence to quash disfavored political views. Pray the Supreme Court puts a stop to it. I do. I pray that the Supreme Court will put a stop to it. Sitting in the press gallery during last week's oral arguments in Fisher v. United States, I wrote in my notebook the questioning by the justices of the Solicitor General made me realize how dangerous 1512 could be. Before its application of January 6 related charges, 1512C2 has never been utilized by the federal prosecutors in any crimes unrelated to evidence tampering. The questions, debates, and controversies begin with the question why federal prosecutors are applying this felony charge clearly enacted to punish destruction of evidence to more than 350 January 6 defendants when it has never been used against any protesters who had temporarily impeded or interrupted any federal proceeding. Why? Prosecutors have also used 1512C2 as a cudgel to frighten January 6 defendants into quick plea deals on lesser misdemeanor charges. The threat of a felony with a maximum 20-year prison sentence can be very persuasive. The Justice Department gets its guilty plea to those lesser charges, and prosecutors move on to the next victim without the costly and time-consuming preparation for trials. There it is. The mostly peaceful, nonviolent protesters on January 6th are being charged for the intent behind their entrance into the Capitol building. Anyone who jokingly posted on social media, hey, we stormed the Capitol today, could be nailed for intent. But what about those who firebombed the federal courthouse in Portland? Yeah, nothing happened to them. They didn't even get arrested. In some cases, they got arrested, but they got released immediately. A new precedent of never-before-used weapon is now aimed selectively by this government against those who think and speak of disapproved ideas, regardless of their actions or inaction. Call it a weapon of mass First Amendment destruction. Let's pray the Supreme Court terminates the government's weaponization of 1512C2 with extreme prejudice. Man, I 110% agree. I 110% agree. It's time to put a stop to the political persecution of people who are not in your, on your side of the fence. This can be turned against the people on the left, you know. It never should be, but it could be. It could easily be if you set that precedent. Now this next item, buyer beware class action lawsuit alleges target illegally collected biometric data on its customers. I, I read this article and, and I have mixed emotions about it. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit to you and then talk about what my mixed emotions are. Retail giant Target illegally collected and stored customers' biometric data, including face and fingerprint scans, according to an Illinois woman who filed a class action lawsuit against the Minnesota-based co company on behalf of herself and other customers. Annette Dean alleges Target violated Illinois. Excuse me. Man. Biometric Information Privacy Act by collecting customers' data without obtaining written consent or sharing data retention and destruction policies. Now, if you read this, 
entire article. Target has apparently created a very sophisticated system of determining who is a shoplifter. They use cameras, they use AI, they have uh, an investigative agency within Target that is so competent that the police and law enforcement have relied on them to solve crimes for them. So they're using this facial recognition and, and advanced, incredibly advanced behavior analysis is what it says, uh, to detect potential shoplifters. And then if they catch them in the act of shoplifting, they have them arrested. But they're doing this without the knowledge of their customers. So, you know, I can understand why this would bother people that their, their data is being collected without their knowledge. But on the other hand, um, it's being used for good purpose to put a stop to shoplifting, which raises prices for all of us. So I really have mixed emotions about this one. Uh, I'll put the link in the description and you can read it and you can decide for yourself uh, which side of this you stand on. I'm kind of, I guess, sort of stuck in the middle. I, you know, we live in an age when basically there's no privacy at all anymore because of technology. Uh, but I, I just don't know. I, I you know, I kind of like the idea that they're catching people or stealing stuff. So anyway, that's that. And then the last one I have is an interesting article by Victor Davis Hanson. I've featured articles from him before, uh, and I'll repeat what I've said about him. He is a historian from Stanford. He is um, extremely knowledgeable of history, of especially ancient history of Greece and Rome and that kind of stuff. And he has a very unique ability to tie it to the present. But he's also quite an, a, an astute observer of current events. And this particular article is entitled, Iran's Nightmares. The Iranian attack on Israel revealed that an incompetent Iran may be as much a threat to itself as to its enemies. Now, I got to tell you, Victor Davis Hansen is verbose. There's no question about that. I've never seen a brief article from him, so be prepared if you're going to read this. <laughs> Excuse me. It's going to take you a little while. I highlighted just the first part. Details of the recent limited Israeli retaliatory strike against Iranian anti-aircraft missile batteries at Isfahan. I guess that is I-S-F-A-H-A-N, Isfahan, are still sketchy. But nonetheless, we can draw some conclusions. Israel's small volley of missiles hit their intended targets to the point of zeroing in on the very launchers designed to stop such incoming ordnance. The target was near the Natanz enrichment facility. That proximity was by design. Israel showed Iran it could take out the very anti-missile battery designed to thwart an attack on its nearby nuclear facility. The larger message sent to the world was that Israel could send a retaliatory barrage at Iranian nuclear sites with reasonable assurances that the incoming attacks could not be stopped. By comparison, Iran's earlier attack on Israel was much greater and more indiscriminate. It was also a huge flop with an estimated 99% of the more than 320 drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles failing to hit their planned targets. So, the upshot of this article is that Iran might not be as big of a threat as we thought they were. They may be more bark than they are bite. And that's encouraging because... If, if they're not anything else, the, the Iranian ayatollahs and all those people that run Iran are warmongers for sure. So anything that says maybe war is less likely is a good thing. As for you, my viewers, I pray that you will live an abundant life, that you will live a long time, that you'll be healthy, and that God will keep you safe from harm. 
I pray that he'll do the same for every person that you love. And I pray most of all that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out.